ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಮಧ್ಯಮ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರ Welcome back. So we were on the topic of Aikyam. We are entering the topic of Aikyam now, of oneness. The topic, the essence of the micro and the macro is the same. The essence of the wave and the wash, uh, what ocean is both just water. Recognizing this oneness is the core topic of Tattva Bodha. And indeed, it's the core topic of Bhagavad Gita, all the Upanishads, Brahma Sutras, or any major Prakarna Granthas that you might go on to study. Microcosm was called Pindanda and Macrocosm was called Brahmanda. Author concluded the topic of Shrishti saying, Evam Pindandam Brahmandam Sambhutam. The identity of both is the same. Both are made of the same five elements and hence are Jada inert. He talked of three layers of both, the causal, the subtle and the cross. Getting your... So now on page 18, we enter chapter 4, we'll chant. Ata ekam vicharaha. Ata ekam vicharaha. Stula sharira bimani. Stula sharira bimani. Jeevanam akam. Jeevanamakam Brahma Pratibimba Bhavati Brahma Pratibimba Bhavati Saeva Jeeva Prakritiya Saeva Jeeva Prakritiya Vasmat Ishwaram Binatsvena ಜಾನಾತಿ ಅವಿದ್ಯೋಪಾಧಿ ಸನ್ ಅವಿದ್ಯೋಪಾಧಿಶನ್ ಆತ್ಮ ಜೀವ ಇತ್ಯುಚ್ಯತೆ ಆತ್ಮಶ್ವರ ಇತ್ಯುಚ್ಯತೆ ಆತ್ಮಶ್ವರ ಇತ್ಯುಚ್ಯತೆ ಜೀವನಾಮಕ this atma who is named jiva stula sharira abhimani identifies with the stula shariram also it implies that he identifies with the sukshma and the karna shariram brahma pratibimba bhavati is a reflection of brahman this confused jiva saiva jiva confused by his own distorted reflection Vasmat Prakritiya, by his own natural ignorance, Ishwaram Binatvena Janati. He looks at Paramatma as different from himself. Did I already do this verse last class? No, right? Okay. This is the 
third time I'm teaching Dr. Boda, so sometimes I'm not sure if I already did this. It sounds very familiar. <laughs> this Jivatma identified with the body, ignorant of the fact that he's all pervading, all powerful Atma. He identifies with these distortions and limitations of the body mind that uh, he thinks that these are its real self. This ignorance is the cause of samsara, of all suffering. Author then defines Jivatma as avidyo padisanatma jiva etichyate. So avidyo, avidya being ignorance is the karana sharidam and hence includes the other two. It take, um, so I take avidya to mean the sharira so avidyopadi sun means atma appearing or being reflected in the sharira trayam, the micro medium, is called jiva. Similarly, the paramatma or ishvara is defined as mayopadi sun, ishvara ityukshate. So maya being the, of course, the cosmic ignorance representing the three cosmic uh, bodies, the gross, subtle, and causal. Uh, the same consciousness principle getting reflected in these bodies is called Ishvara or Paramatma. So the Jivatma is usually an inferior distortion according to what how we perceive and Paramatma is a positive distortion. So we think of Ishvara as omniscient, omnipotent, magnificently beautiful, full of love, all these things. And we think of the jiva ourselves as limited powers. So, whereas the Ishvara has unlimited powers, we think of ourselves having limited knowledge, uh, whereas Ishvara has unlimited knowledge. And hence, we worship Ishvara. But as long as we are absorbed by these distortions, we will be confused. We will see duality. We will see... Ishvara to have superior qualities and us to have inferior qualities. So when we look at the mirror and there is a maybe a smudge on the mirror and you think this smudge is on my face and you try to rub it off, it's that kind of distortion really. We are that original consciousness simply getting reflected in this body and we are confusing ourselves with this body-mind. So this distortion is, of course, the basis of a lot of Dvaitan philosophies, a lot of dualistic philosophies. And a lot of Dvaitan philosophies will largely have the vision of Dasoham. I have a, there is a master-slave relationship between Ishvara and I. Ishvara is the master and I am the slave. But Advaita is asking you to assimilate that these are just distortions because of the differences in the reflecting medium. And it's trying to take you to the understanding of the essence, which is you, the Atma. For an Advaita, there is no master, there is no slave. So yeah, Advaita is asking you to move from Dasoham to Soham. So this notion of separateness arises when you give reality to the costume, the name and form, uh, you give reality to not seeing the essence of the being. It's like the reflection of the sun being formed in various mirrors. It's the same sun getting reflected across different mirrors. Once the reflection is formed, uh, the mirror becomes bright and luminous and the mirror itself can illumine a room. But the light does not belong to the mirror. It belongs to the original sun. So we'll use a diagram to explain the next, I mean, the same concept, a bit more detail. Okay. Right. 
it. Can you see the image on my screen? Okay, so we, these are all the bodies we talked about, right? So the same original consciousness, it's um, reflected across the six mirrors now, the three uh, bodies of the Jiva and the three bodies of the Paramatma. So in the microcosm, uh, there is the Karna Shariram, the Sukshma Shariram, and the Tula Shariram. And the same three Sharirams are also there at the universal level. So let's uh, number them to make it easier. Uh, RM means reflecting medium. So all of these bodies are reflecting mediums. So we're calling the Karana Shariram RM1, the Sukshma Shariram of the Jiva RM2, and the Stula Shariram of the Jiva RM3. Similarly, we are giving the names RM4, 5, and 6, to the macrocosm bodies. And each of these reflecting mediums will reflect like the mirrors, they'll reflect the original consciousness. And the reflection caused by the original consciousness is called, we call reflect um, this RC, reflected consciousness. So again, we numbered it RC one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So this, um, Vedanta gives very specific names for each of these reflected consciousness. So the and the first three names we already saw when we in earlier section of Tatvabodha, when this original consciousness is getting reflected in the Karna Shariram and uh, forming a reflected consciousness, this reflected consciousness is called Pragnya. And the OC reflect, getting reflected in the Sukshma Shariram is called Tejasa. And the OC getting reflected in the Stula Shariram is called Vishwa. These we saw before, I hope you remember. And together, these three reflections, Pragnya, Tejasa, Vishwa, which we identify with in our different states of experience, Together, these three reflections are called Jivatma. So similarly, this uh, when the original consciousness gets reflected in the Karana Prapancha, we call this reflection Antaryami. When the original consciousness gets reflected in the subtle Prapancha, the subtle universe, we call this Hiranyagarbha. And at the Stula, when it's getting reflected, we call it Virat. So this is an important concept because it will come up in various Upanishads. You'll find various Upanishads referring to Antaryami, Hiranyagarbha, and Virat. So you should know what these are. So Virat is basically everything you see. So And we will have chapters in Bhagavad Gita where we are talking about Virat Rupa Ishvara, that is the cosmic form of the Lord. So Virat being this Tula Prapancha, everything that we can perceive, every uh, single thing that you experience with your senses is a form of Ishvara. And hence we worship this uh, multi-form of Ishvara, Virat Rupa Ishvara. And Hiranyagarbha you can take to be that uh, subtle forces which are behind everything else. All the uh, Hiranyagarbha can also be... Uh, synonymously referred to as Ishvara sometimes, right, in, in certain context. Or, but more uh, often, it's uh, the combination of these three, the Antaryami, Hiranyagarbha, and Virat that we call Ishvara or Paramatma. That's the more technical way which is uh, accepted. So when we're talking about Paramatma or Ishvara, we're talking about all these Ishvara uh, in all these three forms. Everything that we see, the power behind everything, uh, all the devatas, we said the power, we all have a limited power for something and devatas is the combination of all these powers and Ishvara is the combination of all the powers of devatas combined together. And Antaryami is uh, where 
it uh, all originated from, the cause of all these. So in some Puranic de depictions, you will see Antaryami or Vishnu will have, um, from the navel, will be coming uh, the lotus on which Lord Brahmaji sits. So this is in Puranic de depictions. Antaryami is depicted as Vishnu and in Hiranyagarbha is depicted as Lord Brahmaji. Any questions in this? Hare Krishna, Yes, please. Uh, there is one question. Not a question exactly. I want to know that Mayo Padi Sanatma and Ishwar mm -hmm. uh, can be called as outcome of the deluded conscious? In a way, yes. Uh, it's also because it's again, Ishwara is not calling himself Ishwara, right? So this is also the Jiva who's calling this distortion Ishwara. So we create a positive distortion and call this uh, fourth Ishvara. So Maya is, uh, another name for Maya is Mula Vidya. So even this Maya is uh, another form of Avidya which is causing this distortions. So can conscious be deluded? Con we can call it delusion, is... yes. So we say the jiva again, it's from the jiva's point of view that uh, there is ignorance. Okay. From Ishwara's point of view, there is no ignorance. Ishwara okay. is free okay. of uh, any ignorance. Uh, same as any avatars, you will see certain verses in Bhagavad Gita referring to it. Avatars are also free of any ignorance. They, they are born because Jiva's birth that we saw already is due to karma. It's a okay. falling down. And the birth happens because of past life karma, which needs to be exhausted. Mm -hmm. But an, an avatar's birth uh, is uh, more of a rising up. It's not because of karma. It's because uh, there is a disbalance of uh, dharma and adharma in the world, so an avatar manifests, and uh, it okay. spontaneously manifests, like in the. So same, only for the, the under, understanding point, we can check this out. Otherwise, conscious is pure conscious. That's all. Yeah, consciousness is pure consciousness, and the pure consciousness. I mean, we can't even distortion. call it pure conscious. Is conscious? That's all. Yes, sure. You can call not, it. Uh, not pure, not important, nothing like. That. Yes, I mean. We it is we are trying to see the undistorted consciousness. We call it original consciousness to for the for us all to have the same vocabulary, you know, the OC, or you can call it absolute consciousness. Okay. Thank you. And it is for sure one of the characteristics, um, not really characteristic, the intrinsic qualities of this absolute qual consciousness is uh, pureness, nirmala. So when you do medit uh, meditation on yourself later, you will meditate on yourself as this um, pure consciousness, the un which cannot be distorted by anything. That all these distortions are merely the costumes, which the mirrors, which might be damaged, which uh, we are wrongly assuming, taking the distortions of the broken mirrors to be ourselves. Whereas we are that light shine. Yes. So the Thank you. Thank you. Okay. the the sentiency that we observe in whether be it Jiva or, or Ishvara. So there is this uh, cosmic force at play, which uh, there are these planets moving around at unimaginable speeds. Uh, without colliding, right? Ishvara is uh, responsible for that. There are these um, jivas being born uh, across the earth to exhaust a very specific type of karma and situations have to be just right for the jivas to exhaust the karma that they've been born with. So even when a mosquito bites you, it's uh, the mosquito, there, it's an amount of uh, punyam being exhausted for the mosquito because it's getting to feed 
And it's a certain amount of flight papam getting exhausted for you because you're getting bitten. <laughs> Uh, so these are very specific conditions for these millions of jivas, billions of jivas to exhaust their karma has to be created. So we say Ishvara, uh, the cosmic forces are creating, uh, managing all these, right? So this is a positive distortion that we place on Paramatma. So the OC or original consciousness, we can also call Atma Chaitanyam, is simply being reflected in all these different bodies. Uh, just like mirror is capable of uh, reflecting sunlight. And if you remember, one of our principles of consciousness, the capsules of consciousness was consciousness survives the death of the body, but the it can only, it's not, it can no longer be perceived with the without the reflecting medium of the body. So consciousness itself is eternal. It always was, always will be. But without a reflecting medium, we might not be able to observe it. Similarly, when you look at a rock, uh, it is still consciousness. The consciousness principle is still there. But because the rock does not have a subtle body, uh, which can reflect the consciousness, we cannot perceive consciousness in that rock. Whereas in a plant, you can perceive it to a certain level. In an animal, you can perceive it more. In humans, a lot more. Right? So the nature and size of reflections will depend basically on the reflecting medium. Like if you enter a playhouse with a lot of different mirrors, uh, certain mirrors might make you look elongated. Certain mirrors might make you look bloated up like a balloon uh, or just have very large ears, uh, all these things. But these are all different distortions of the same face, same body that you're seeing across these different mirrors. So these bigger reflecting mediums are also just like these mirrors in a playhouse. The reflection is just so sophisticated that we don't realize that it's just a reflection. And we think it's the original, but uh, perception is not reality. This is this perception, uh, learning to falsely rely on this perception is also something we learned. I like um, given this example a few times, uh, I find it really funny, this uh, baby girl of uh, my friend, um, she was uh, she was born during the COVID time, so she didn't meet a lot of um, the people in the family. So they would they would often have uh, you know video calls um, and put her on video with all these different family members, the grandparents, and uh, so on, so she could get to know all of them. So one day when she was a bit older, uh, my friend was trying to explain the concept of. Uh, who's older and who's younger to her, right? So she said, you're very small, right? And what about mama and papa? And she's like, yeah, they're big. She understood that. And she's like, uh, then she asked, what about um, this, uh, you know, great uncle of yours, like this cha-cha that you saw? And she goes, oh, he's very small, right? So because for her, she had only ever seen him on the video screen which uh, the phone screen, which was this small. So for him, this person was in reality this small because that's how she's ever experienced him. And uh, so even growing up, we are like that. We, we also have the same distortion that this child did. It, it's just that we all share this distortion. So we take some comfort in that uh, mutual understanding of the distortion that we have. But that's the distortions um, that we're trying to drop now. The jivatma is simply limited by the smaller size of the reflecting medium it's occupying and the challenges of the body, like uh, having limited knowledge or limited power. These are all challenges of the body and mind, the upadi that the jivatma is occupying simply. 
the jivatma reflection is hence subject to attributes or gunas of the reflecting medium. If it's a very uh, tamasic body and mind, uh, you might say this person is very dull. Uh, if it's a, a very rajasic, you might say this person is too fiery. Or a vata personality, you might say this person just can't sit still. But these are all just the uh, gunas of the body-mind that is being reflected by the same. Paramatma, on the other hand, of course, has this whole uh, creation as the body. The gross, subtle, and causal universe is the body of Ishwara. The so the this all pervading consciousness when it um, uses when it's seen from the reflecting medium of this creation it of course looks very superior and when you think of all the laws that are maintained so beautifully precisely it looks even more impressive to truly appreciate ishvara uh, it's uh, good for a Vedantic student also to look at cosmology, the billions of stars and planets which exist, how they all manage to move about in these unthinkable speeds, whereas we, the jiva, would, uh, if we were to drive in a speed above 120, we would probably have an accident. So when Vedanta is telling you that Ishwara and jiva are identical, the critical question is, uh, is it telling you to stop worshipping Ishwara? No, not really, because bhakti is also an important path to in this spiritual life. So you would find that um, many enlightened souls, even after enlightenment, continued bhakti just for the love of it. Ramana Maharshi settled in Arunachala so he could be near this um, hill in which he saw Shiva. Uh, even Adi Shankaracharya wrote many proses of bhakti. So because while we are saying in a sense me and Ishvara are the same, this is with an understanding that from an RM angle, from the reflecting median angle, they're actually different. They are diametrically and diagonally opposite, in fact. Uh, the, only from the original consciousness angle, me and Ishwara are the same. So this dualistic bhakti, dualistic um, surrender, is a step in Vedantic inquiry. We don't reject dualistic bhakti. We can still use it till such time that before we are able to transcend it. Because when at the point when Vedanta is asking you to say, I am everything, I am Ishwara also, it's you need to be able to say it with the the, the I. When you say you're no longer associated with this body mind, then it's complex. And when you're saying I am Ishwara, you're basically saying everything is Ishwara. Right? So when you have that understanding that everything I see is Ishwara, that's the point where you can start dropping at least some part of the bhakti. So even bhakti happens in stages. Most of us start off with um, ekarupa, ekarupa bhakti, uh, for worshipping one form of Ishvara, if not in this lifetime, at some lifetime. For me, it was um, because as a child, I was, uh, I was taken to temples, but no one could answer these questions I had. I used to feel, but God cannot be in this rock. You know, now I've come to the stage where I can go to a temple and also worship there because I know God is also in that rock. All right, so of course I could do uh, an action of bhakti while simply walking, looking at a tree also. Uh, it's understanding that everything is Ishvara. 
and any questions before we continue? Continue. The author is now telling us that samsara, this suffering, is due to this Veda uh, the difference in our viewpoint. Okay, I'll chant. Evam upadi bedad. Evam upadi bedad. Jeeveshwara beda drishtihi. Jeeveshwara beda drishtihi. Yavat paryantam. Yavat paryantam. Tishtati. Tishtati. Tavat paryantam. Tavat paryantam. Janma maranadi rupa samsaro. Janma maranadi rupa samsaro. Nanivartate. Nanivartate. Tasmat karanat. Tasmat karanat. Najiveshwara your beda drishti buddhi svikarya. Najiveshwar, your the Buddhi Vikarya. Thank you. So it says, Evam in this manner, Upadi Bedat, what with the differences in Upadi, uh, Upadi, I hope you remember what it means, the limiting adjunct, Jiva, uh, Ishwara Bedadristi, the per perception of difference between the individual and the Lord. Uh, yavat pariyantam, as long as it remains tishtati, tatvat pariyantam, until such time, janma baranadi rupa samsara, this, this samsara, the cycle of birth and death, nanivartate, um, does not come to an end. So in this manner, as long as the perception or conclusion of difference between the individual and the Lord which is wrought by differences in the limiting adjunct remains until such time samsara, this life of becoming in the form of birth, death, etc., does not come to an end. What is this, etc.? To come, to come, the trauma of uh, all this uh, shadvikara, the, the six changes that the body must go through, like old age and death. So all this will not come to an end. This seeming difference, author is telling us, is because of the upadi alone. And it's because of avidya, ignorance. The author gives us advice on this beda drishti. Beda drishti meaning this uh, difference in perception, this distortion, distorted vision. Uh, it's, he says, tasmat karna, therefore for that reason, Jiva, Jiva Ishwara Yoho, between the Jiva and Ishwara, Beda Buddhi, the conclusion of difference, Nasvikarya, is not to be accepted. Do not accept this vision of difference between Jiva and Ishwara. This is why human beings are suffering, not because of events in life or planetary positions. Suffering is caused only because of these, this distorted vision. They are like uh, people with a cataract wanting uh, the light in the room to be increased so that they can see better. The difference we are perceiving is internal. Why is it that the same situations affect different people differently? Even if there is a something like a death in the family or a big tragedy in the family, you will see that it affects different people differently. Some will get over it, uh, accept it and move on with life uh, in a few days or weeks. Others might take years or a lifetime to get over. Actually, we also know that the many enlightened beings who live in the same earth that we live on and uh, can remain perfectly 
happy can remain in that state of bliss while some others um, in the same situation suffer. There is, um, I forget who it was, uh, the name of uh, who it was, but there is one um, one person who's supposed to be enlightened who lived in the slums of uh, Calcutta, I think. And um, after enlightenment, he just continued to live there because he didn't see anything wrong with where he was anymore. So it's possible for, and you will see it, be it, um, you know, there are certain things we think uh, will make us happy, but you will often see these very rich people who are completely unhappy, who have everything that they could possibly want in life, um, all the wealth, their healthy family, uh, all the security, all the all their wants, uh, all their desires, which can be met, but they will still be completely miserable. And on the other hand, sometimes you will see these poor people on the street, uh, especially in India, who are, um, you know, laughing their hearts out, are completely happy, irrespective of uh, having very less. So happiness is, of course, not a thing. Hopefully we've all observed that by now. It is uh, an internal state of the mind. It's because of our perception of what will make us happy. It's this perception of uh, do we feel a, we have a feeling of lack or do we have a feeling of completeness? That is what's responsible for happiness. It's uh, while the work of, towards this Simulating this knowledge. In the meantime, we can still work on our uh, per perception, our uh, sense of discernment. The sense of discernment can be refined with your intellect. Much before I came to Vedanta, uh, I remember one thing which I, uh, which helped me a lot in my own life was in our school books. There used to be always a quote of uh, Gandhi in many of the books. It was a quote where he was saying, if you find yourself unhappy because you can't have something that you want, think of the poorest, um, most unfortunate person you ever come across in your life. And ask, the thing that I want now, will it make any difference to this person's life? Right? And uh, most of us, especially those of us who are living in India, we've seen extreme poverty every day. And maybe we've grown a certain sense of uh, dispassion uh, towards this poverty that is that we see. That, that is also fine. You have to do what is required to continue functioning well. But uh, we've all seen these people uh, who have absolutely nothing, might be severely disfigured. And, uh, most of these things that we crave for or un are unhappy for when we don't get these things, if we imagine this person, um, if for me it used to be the longest time the person who came to mind was this very old woman who uh, had a huge hump on her back and she was completely crippled uh, sitting uh, begging in uh, Delhi in peak winter where um, you know and it was I think uh, less than five degrees that night so she was shivering in her thin clothes so I can't imagine most of the things that I've ever wanted would be of any use to her I was a child at that time so there wasn't uh, I didn't have the sense to do something to help but we all probably have some examples like that. And Deepa is telling me, I think the person I was thinking of is Swami Ramakrishna Paramahansa. I think you're right. Thank you, Deepa. And so, so indeed, there's the, this Veda Drishti is uh, what causes a lot of our problems at the higher level, but 
in the in the everyday day to day life we can also work on refining our discernment to get there right? so of course when um, the examples i gave some are at a very vyavaharic level all right so you can think of uh, you can exercise your discernment in the level of will this thing really uh, make me happy or um, do I uh, can I be happy without it also right and is it really going to serve me in the long run you can ask things like that but of course we also saw that discernment real viveka is what nitya nitya vastu viveka so that's the final discernment as with Antic students that we're trying to refine that anything that you that's making you unhappy right now you ask yourself is this thing permanent or impermanent and uh, what is it that I'm looking for do I want limited happiness or do I want permanent lasting infinite happiness and you can inquire it from that angle and in that inquiry you might find that maybe right now you still want those things and that's fine and in that case you shouldn't try to forcefully uh, ex uh, give away or drop that need uh, there's any kind of uh, aggression force in trying to drop these needs that you have or trying to deny these needs that you have will uh, cause an imbalance will cause more suffering because uh, that's not something you can purely take care of with reasoning and it might lead to what um, a certain Buddhist psychologist uh, coined the term spiritual bypassing. So you can't try to hold on to the absolute truth denying your need for the relative. All right? So there is, um, if you are at the, yeah, and you have to judge that for yourself. Because you could be saying all the right words and a teacher uh, might not or, um, you know, anyone who's counseling you might not really know where you are at. So you could be saying the right words of uh, being over these vyavaharic needs, but only you know for yourself. So if there is certain um, vyavaharic needs that you have, accept it and work with the situation to also meet those relational needs that you might have. And uh, at the same time, you can also practice discernment. So over a longer run, you're able to genuinely transcend those needs. Any questions? So we can do we have 15 minutes so we can do the one more verse. The next verse on page 18 end. Nanu Sahankarasya. Nanu Sahankarasya. Inchignesya Inchignesya Jeevasya Jeevasya Nihankarasya Nirankarasya Sarvagnesya Sarvagnesya Ishwarasya Ishwarasya Tatva Masiti Tatva Masiti Mahavakya Mahavakya Katam Veda Buddhihi Katam Veda Buddhihi Vadibhyoho Vadibhyoho Viruddharma Krantatvat Virudha Dharma Kaan Patvat 
so to all this which was said that uh, basically do not accept this uh, Veda Buddhi between Ishwara and yourself and now the student is, has an objection is uh, saying Nanu but Katam how can there be the knowledge of non-difference uh, Jeevasya between the Jeeva the individual Sahankarasya who has the I notion endowed, endowed with this strong Ahamkara the student is referring to his own strong sense of I-ness, uh, the attributes he relates to, which he thinks makes him different from others. We might be used to be thinking of this as individuality, but this is also an imitation posed by the ego, that this is my unique story. I was born here, I went to this college, I have these talents and so on. This is all ahankara, this uh, wrong notion of ainess. So kinshignasya, who has limited knowledge, I am uh, of limited knowledge. There's so many things in the world I know nothing about. Others I know, but I'm doubtful. So many other things I learned, but I forgot. And so he's saying, how can there be this notion of, of oneness, non-difference between this jiva with all these problems and Ishwarasya and of uh, and of Ishwara who is Nihankarasya, who is devoid of ego, Sarvagnyasa is all knowledgeable. So how can I accept this Mahavakyam, this great sentence which says Tattva Masi, thou art that which reveals the oneness between uh, these two seemingly very different things. Because, uh, and the last line says, because the Jiva and Ishwara are possessed by very contrary attributes. It's all a fair point. The said implication of the student, and uh, if many of you are hearing this for the first time, it's prob it's understandable, it's very hard to accept this implication that you and Ishwara are the same. So the student is saying, okay, great, I hear what you're saying, but uh, it's thinking and there's no way I'll be able to accept this. Maybe some of you are thinking that too. So our imaginary students, like all the students here, are very polite, of course. So no one's telling the teacher on their face that this is ridiculous and you've completely lost it. And uh, so you're still waiting to clarify your doubts, uh, which I appreciate. <laughs> so the misconceptions can go away with the right knowledge. Whenever something needs to be understood, an inquiry has to be made. So Tattva Masi is an equation, right? And to understand any equation, you have to inquire into it. So as a child, when you first saw like a math equation, if you saw 5 plus 3 is equal to 8, right? Or you say you saw 5 plus 3 is equal to 10 minus 2. Ah, so when you look at the both sides of the equation, there is nothing which looks similar at all. 5, 3 plus, there is 10, 2 and minus. None of these look on the face of it at all the same. But yet, the equation is telling you both of these are the same. Right? So then you inquire into it. And you find, and now probably both of all of you realize that 5 plus 3 is 8, 10 minus 2 is 8, and in that sense, they're the same. Similarly, if you see an equation like E is equal to mc squared, you inquire into what was E, what was m, c, and squared, and you understood that equation. So is with this Vedantic equation of Tattvamasi. On the face of it, there seems to be only differences when you look at what is a jiva and what is Ishvara. Yet Vedanta is telling you that both of them are one and the same. It's funny that uh, people say, uh, people criticize Vedanta as being too intellectual. I say it's funny because it's true, it is intellectual because the problem we have is also intellectual. Uh, 
the ultimate problem we have is intellectual. You are Brahman. Uh, there is nothing you can do to gain this Brahmanship status. Um, to, by the definition of Brahman being eternal, it means that Brahman always was, always will be. So you can't do something limited to gain the eternal or some finite action will give you infinite bliss. Some religions do promise that, that you live a good life now and uh, you can go to an eternal heaven. I don't know how many of your intellect uh, can be satisfied with that. Do you think it's really sounds logical to say that I live 70, 80, 100 years good life and for that I will enjoy eternal bliss. Maybe your intellect is not satisfied with that. So you're here inquiring. So what is it that does make sense to you? So your intellect ultimately for anything that scriptures is saying, your intellect has to be satisfied. And uh, so this, we'll inquire more into this equation now, Tattva Masi. This is one of the most, uh, perhaps the most popular Mahavakya, the great statements comes from the Samaveda in from Chandokya Upanishad specifically that that uh, thou are that that being the Paramatma the cosmic order maintaining intelligence of whose body is the entire Jagat itself and thou this apparently small looking Jivatma with limited capabilities who might feel miserable because you got a cold and your nose is congested or uh, you've lost your temper because someone cut you off in traffic. All these challenges that I face. And the Mahavakyam is telling you that you, Jiva, are the same as this Paramatma. You are God. It might seem laughable when you first hear it. it may even seem like blasphemy to some of you. Because we all grew up in this world of duality, of multiplicity. Uh, many have grown up in religious households where uh, it's a particular Ishtadevata uh, was uh, worshipped. And we have a very strong notion that, at least some of us, that God is the creator and I am the created. God is the all powerful and I have limited capabilities. God is omnipotent, omnipresent, compassionate. And you're saying that I am this God? How outrageous, you might think. So this simple formula is difficult to understand. Uh, the explanation is actually simple, but it's difficult to truly assimilate. The mind has to be prepared to assimilate this knowledge. Which is why Vedantic texts will also give you various ways to prepare the mind, like karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, all these processes of meditation and uh, asana and so on, the dharmic way of living. All these practices are there to purify the mind for chitta shuddhi, so that the mind is sufficiently refined to really understand this equation. Right. So, but in the meantime, it will also give you uh, go into this equation some more and explain how what this actually means. So the next topic of how do you really break down this equation will take a little longer. So I think I won't take it right now. I'll save it for the next class. Any questions? Spandana ji, how can we define the righteous knowledge? Righteous knowledge? Yes. In what way? That's not a word. knowledge is always right. Mm, I didn't say that. So from what context are you saying? Uh, should we know what we should know and ignore what we should ignore? Is that knowledge? We've all um, refined our knowledge over time, right? 
So there are certain things we thought we knew. Even science com constantly refines what they think they know. Uh, when it comes to Shastric knowledge, that's why like at the very beginning of this course, we went through the Pramanams, what is considered a valid source of knowledge, that it should be self-valid by itself and nothing else should be able to negate it. Otherwise, it becomes an error. So because we're talking about something which is not perceivable by the senses, um, Brahman, which is not perceivable by the senses, and we are doing this inquiry, we did this inquiry to check, can something tell me about this absolute consciousness? And uh, so far, we are only left with the pramanam of conscious uh, of Shastra, which can actually talk about consciousness. So perhaps it needs a bit more work to know if I accept Veda as pramanam for myself or not. Right? So I don't know where you are in that journey. But if you accept Veda as pramanam, it again doesn't mean blind faith. You accept that... Um, Nothing else should be able to negate what Veda is saying, right? So you can, till such time, the faith is truly there. You can also check in with logic, with, uh, you know, other measurable proofs. If something is negating what Veda is telling you, if you can accept uh, Veda as Pramanam, then you can accept a lot of things said in the Vedas. So that's one source of knowledge that we have. Does that kind of get at uh, what you're asking? Yes, thank you. To an extent. Okay. <laughs> you can uh, you can ask for clarification if there's some part. I was wondering, like, whatever situation we are in right now, we would know what we need to know to tackle that problem and what we need yes. to ignore. Just ignore. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's a very, we all, we are all refining our intellect over time, right? So this is, these are more vivaharic questions, but uh, yeah, we, a healthy intellect and a healthy ego will accept what they don't know and will seek help, uh, will seek solutions for the things that they don't know. Of course, you will find perfectly... What if they grown adults who refuse to accept something they don't know and are too stubborn to ever ask for help. Right? And we can see what kind of pitfalls that lead to. So there are a lot of, so all these parts that we do, um, uh, all these now, right now, Tathvabodha, you're not being introduced to many of them, but in Bhagavad Gita, you will be introduced to all these different paths uh, of Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Raj Yoga practices, um, which are all meant to, uh, for, let's, for Chitta Shuddhi, or in today's words, you can call it uh, personality development. So, but the ultimate aim of Vedanta is not uh, personality development, it's personality annihilation. It's uh, for you to realize that uh, there is no personality, <laughs> right? But um, part of that personality is also this intellect and for that ultimate knowledge to take root, that uh, intellect has to be sufficiently refined and that uh, there needs to be sufficient chitta shuddhi. But don't you need a personality? Pardon me? Wouldn't you need a certain personality to live? To yeah. Carry yours. So, of course, when I say personality, it's a bit uh, basically what we're annihilating is the hamkara, the ego, this strong sense of highness. And of course, personality, in if you're talking about the vasanas, that will continue. So even an enlightened person will, there are certain things they will like doing and certain things they will dislike doing. It's just that none of these likes and dislikes are binding. So they are perfectly happy, even if they can't do the things they like, and they're perfectly happy, 
even if they have to do some things they don't particularly like. In that sense, yeah, personality likes and dislikes will continue. Only the binding nature of those likes and dislikes will disappear. Any other question? Okay, can do the closing players. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purna Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Ayyom Shri Guru Bhyonama Thank you, Sundar Thank you, Sundar Thank you, Sundar Have a beautiful week.